Hello, and welcome to the League of Women Voters of Portland Voter Forum for candidates running for mayor of Portland. I'm Carolyn Bubert, president of the Local League, and I'll be moderating this uh, voter forum today. The League is a nonpartisan organization devoted to making democracy work. We believe that democracy works best when voters are informed about the issues and engaged with their communities. And we are presenting this forum to give eligible voters an opportunity to learn more about these candidates. We're grateful for the support of the Carol and Belma Sailing Foundation, the Weiss Foundation, the League of Women Voters Education Fund, and our media partner, Metro East Community Media. A word about the candidates invited to uh, today and those who are participating. There are 19 candidates running for the office of mayor in this election. Several years ago, in recognition that a joint appearance of that number of candidates does not allow a meaningful consideration of the serious candidates, the League put in place a process that permitted it to winnow candidates participating in a voter forum to those candidates who demonstrated significant voter interest and support. The specific objective and subjective criteria for that the League used to determine such candidates is spelled out in our policies and procedures, which are online at www.lwvpdx.org. Five candidates were, were invited, uh, five mayor candidates were invited by our League to participate in this forum, and three are participating. They are Lee Vostis, Commissioner Carmen Rubio, and Keith Wilson. The fifth, um, the fourth and fifth candidates, um, Commissioner Maps and Commissioner Gonzalez, were unable to attend. Under the voter forum protocol agreed to in writing by the participating candidates for this event, each of the speakers will give a one minute opening statement, followed by questions we've prepared, and the questions are based on our league positions and the interests of our members. And then the candidates uh, the candidates have not been told what the questions are in advance. And each candidate will then get a one minute closing statement. And each, uh, each candidate will get 60 minutes to answer each question. We use the Oregon Secretary of State's current and previous official candidate random alphabets drawn for every election cycle to determine the order in which the candidates will present their opening and closing statements and answer the question. Mr. Wilson will give the first opening statement. Mr. Wilson, go ahead. You bet. You know, Carolyn, you had said we get 60 minutes to answer the questions, each question. So, oh my God, we're going to be in it for a long time. 60 seconds. I'm so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no. Absolutely. So, it's absolutely yeah, okay. Uh, I've been go known ahead. to talk long, but not that long. So, <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Keith Wilson, and I'm running for mayor to the real change to Portland. We can't accept more failures from the same city politicians that got us into this mess. As a candidate from the private sector, what makes me unique is that I have a proven plan to end unsheltered homelessness in my first year as mayor. And I always like to describe what unsheltered homelessness is. It's those that are suffering on our streets in tents and RVs, campers and boats and the like. I know this is a bold statement and I'm making it because I've done the research and I've gathered the team, I've opened shelters and I've created a roadmap and I have the executive experience that the new mayor's role will allow me to usher this project successfully. And when we accomplish this, we'll decrease crime, we'll increase job opportunities and economic growth and we'll better everybody's livability in Portland. We can't accept the status quo any longer. Portland has become a national symbol of failed city policies, and it's time for real change. And thank you for this discussion. And I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Ms. Ostis, go ahead. 
Good evening, everybody. My name is Leave Ostis. I'm a mom and an artist, musician, writer, and I jumped into the race because I see Portland as having a crisis of hopelessness. And I was really yearning for a candidate to deliver a message of hope that could be for us all. Um, so my platform is primarily hope, arts, and compassion. I want arts to be a driver in revitalizing Portland, and I want us to remember our artists, how much they have brought to Portland economically and inspirationally. So I'm trying to um, summon my artist friends to take over City Hall, take back City Hall, and re remind Portlanders of hope and also the environment. I really want to center the environment because I think with with the climate change all around us, that that is a real driver of hopelessness in us all. And so to remember our river, our fertile valleys, to center those in conversation, to center those in our in our artists dialogue, too, as we move forward into a new, more visionary, more compassionate Portland for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Rubio, opening statement. Thank you. I'm running for mayor because I love this city and I don't have to tell anyone listening that we have serious work ahead to turn our city around. And I started this journey with a real honest recognition of where we are as a city. And all of us know that the status quo is completely unacceptable. But I also know that we don't need to forget who we are as Portlanders to change things. And uh, the most accomplished as the most accomplished candidate in this race, I know that when we work together and lean into our Portland values, we get great things done. It's how we do it here in Portland. And that's how I also know that Portland's best days are still ahead of us. But it takes a leader with grit and competency and a track record for getting things done to get it done. And this is why I ask you to join me and vote for me and let's create a world-class Portland that's better and safer and more vibrant than it's best for all of us. Thank you. On to the questions. So the first question goes to Ms. Ostas. What Portland City Charter changes, if any, would you support concerning the office of mayor? I like the charter that it was voted in by Portland voters. I'm very excited about the new form of government. It's going to be a transition. I hope we find the, the city manager who has experience in transitioning from our old form of government to the new form of government. But I'm really proud of Portland voters for these changes that they have voted in. And, it, and there's a lot of really brilliant people running and I think we're going to see some really wonderful changes with the charter as is. Thank you. Mr. Wilson, what Portland City charter changes, if any, would you support concerning the office of mayor? So regarding office of mayor, I, I think the most significant change really isn't necessarily the mayor. It's the representative form of government where we have uh, four districts and each district has three individual uh, representatives now, and those districts actually become uh, many cities, if you will, where the representatives and the neighbors have a conversation with the the counselors, and now the counselors have a relationship with the mayor, and then we get to implement the spirit and the focus on the new legislation in the city. So as the mayor, I get to work in a power sharing agreement with the counselors to implement all the new legislation as the chief implementer, if you will, to really focus on making sure that the office of the mayor and the city is running well, and we are mission and focus on all the citizens because they have more of a voice now. Thank you. Commissioner Rubio. I absolutely support the charter changes. I'm very excited about these changes. I think they're historic. And I'm very excited in particular um, about the district's because they will allow more representation from all, all corners of the city. Um, and uh, for the first time ever, we will have uh, a big look across the city um, that actually takes into consideration all of the uniqueness um, around the city. Um, I also love uh, in the mayor's role that there will be now the ability as the executive leader to have um, 
the big look across the whole enterprise of the city. And the city can now act um, through the mayor with one voice as one city and have one relationship to its residents um, in a way that just was not um, very clear before for Portlanders. Um, and ultimately, uh, the mayor will be the chief champion as well and, and have a responsibility to have a good collaborative relationship with its council. Thank you. So for the next question, we'll go first to Mr. Wilson. Please describe how you would make the determination of whether a possible action or activity you might take as mayor might be a conflict of interest. Uh, a conflict of interest with the council? A conflict of interest to, to your uh, In other words, uh, responsibility to the city. So um, let's just, I'll assume it's a conflict of interest, say with my core values of something, a conflict with the city. Um, well, let me, I'll just read into that question, Carolyn. Let's say it's a legislative law that the councilors agreed to, but doesn't really reflect how I feel the city uh, should be run or a, a vision for the city. Regardless of my thoughts and regardless of what my beliefs are, I have to trust the, the laws of the city and our councilors because those are the voices of the neighbors, if you will. And so regardless of my thoughts, conflict of interest, I would have to implement that law as it was written with the spirit and the intent of that law that would be provided to me. So my job is to make sure the enterprise, the city, is running well, but it also has to be the voice of the people. And my job is to implement that voice as best and as efficiently for the benefit of everybody in the city. Regardless of what my beliefs are, I have to trust the counselors are making the right laws at the right time. Thank you. Ms. Astis. Unmute myself. Okay. Um, so what I suspect possibly would be a conflict of interest for me is um, my feelings about the carceral system and the need to hire um, the chief of police. I do love reaching across the aisle. It's something we do at the downtown Let's say Mary's Club all the time. I love to talk to people from every line of work, but I do think Portland's police, the culture in the police department is something that really needs to change. And I know we're up against a union and then we have oversight from the feds. So there's a lot of players there. I would um, I would connect with every Portlander and including our police to find what the people want and insist that that culture try to, to, to give the people what they want. I think for now, the last 10, 20 years, we've had some real dark times on the, um, with our policing and I would do whatever I could to hire a chief of police who spoke to the values of the people first. Thank you. Commissioner Rubio. Uh, so currently on council, um, when we have a conflict or a perception of conflict, we declare that in council uh, before the vote. And if it's an actual conflict, um, we need to get up out of our seat and literally leave the room um, and not vote on that item. So those are the actual, um, you know, votes that happen. However, as mayor, we will not have a vote on council. So I believe it's more incumbent upon the mayor to actually have a strong sense of um, ethics. So when there is perceived conflict, or if you all, if I've already taken a, a strong position or have strong feelings on an issue, and I'm having to implement a policy from council that is in conflict with, with how I feel about it, I would, I would have to, I would feel compelled to declare my bias around it. Um, and also uh, depending on the situation, I would also um, surround myself or maybe have some designees that would have to uh, consider the issue so that I'm checking for my own biases. Um, but I would it would it would be my charge as mayor to as objectively consider that issue as as possible. And if I can't do that objectively, then then it's my responsibility to make sure that I have people uh, designated to do that. Okay, thank you. 
So for the next question, we'll start with Ms. Ostas. Where, if at all, do you see the interests of the city's residential owners and renters diverging? And what difference could it make in city policy decisions? Um, well, renters are really in need of protections right now. I think we're all very aware of that. And sometimes that does fly in the face of what owners desire. I think we need a renter's bill of rights and we need it right away. I am a homeowner. I do have three renters at any one time in my duplex. But um, so I'm, I'm constantly aware of what I need to charge as a landlord to keep up with the, the um, increase in um, services, utilities, and also how little extra my tenants have. So I, I would always advocate for the renters first. That's where my heart lies, the people um, making sure that they are that the cost of living is such that many most people can thrive. However, the most people can thrive here is what I advocate for and would as mayor. Thank you. Commissioner Rubio. I would say there's so many issues that are complex around around this, but a few that I have um, observed that where there are some uh, different kinds of tensions is uh, one is largely around um, neighborhoods and infill. Um, a lot of owners uh, or some owners feel like um, they want uh, their neighborhoods to, to maintain a certain look or character or feel um, while some housing advocates um, want more um, housing and they want more infill in different kinds of spaces. And some that's that's a that's a tension that is um, prevalent and still going. And I hear about it even to this day. Um, also, um, the tension definitely of renters um, rights versus, you know, um, the uh, owners rights, as as uh, Lee was just mentioning, um, those kinds of uh differences and challenges about uh, what to what extent uh, do renters need uh, protections versus to what extent do um, owners um, have the ability uh, to move on things legally. And so that's always um, an area of non-clarity that the city has struggled, I think, to have some clarity and, and uh, position on. And so hopefully we will we will resolve that and get some clarity moving forward. Um, and then the last one connected to this is also around eviction. And the city has uh, some mediation services which have been more helpful, um, but those funds uh, get expended very rapidly. So I do think there's a way to have some resolution um, if we can around mediation, that's always to resolve the issues is always preferable than taking a position that is oppositional. Thank you. You're watching the Voters Forum from the League of Women Voters of Portland with mayoral candidates. Our next question goes to Mr. Wilson. What are the most important factors in the mayor's development of the city's budget? Well, let's just start out with reality. Next year, our budget's gonna be impacted and it's going to fall dramatically. We've seen tens of thousands of people leave our city. We've seen businesses fail and leaving, and these are not faceless, nameless businesses. Uh, we've seen our property taxes start to fall because of livability in our community. We have the highest vacancy rate in the nation. So I would say the solution isn't complex. We have to turn our city around focus on cleanliness, focus on restoring our downtown core in our city. As far as establishing the budget, the focus is, is really bringing back our livability. We see our budget falling um, and we're gonna have to address that. But some of the biggest benefits is reducing waste in our city. The new form of government is gonna allow the mayor to do that. And because we're gonna be looking at one enterprise, we've got to reduce waste in our system. A perfect example is we have the highest unsheltered homeless rate in the nation. And the costs associated on our budget because of that waste or poor leadership is $300 million. That money could be used to uh, restore services, restore police services, uh, to then build back the $30 million we just took out of our transportation budget. We have got to reduce the costs of our enterprise and then fund our city. And that's where we're gonna do that through our budget as it's a statement of our policies. But we've got to 
um, improve livability and restore our community so we can restore our budget uh, to its um, most efficient manner to provide services in our community. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ostis. I'll echo a lot of what Keith said. Um, it is going to be an um, even more tighter budget next year, and we're going to have to do um, back to basics budget. I think, again, what Keith was saying, there's a lot of redundancies, there's waste. We need to have very um, audits. People want transparency at the budget level. And I think we are spending a lot more on housing and health um, for solutions the solutions aren't commensurate with what we're spending. And so I've looked into various other states that are having better success for less, like Massachusetts. They have a wonderful rapid rehousing policy. There are, there are, there's a lot of data out there that we could um, use to inform our housing policies, our health policies. Um, we do need to make sure that the police and fire are right size so that there aren't, there isn't overtime um, that drains our budget. And really, yeah, back to basics budget, we need to hear what the, the voters value most and prioritize those things because it is going to be, we're all going to be tightening our belts and, and we can see clearly how many services are, are needed desperately. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Um, I too agree uh, with my two colleagues here that this is about going back to the fundamentals um, and it, it is going to be another cut budget this year, um, which is always very challenging. Um, so for me, there really uh, there it really requires a focus on two things. The first is our key city services. Um, obviously, our, our first responder fire life safety uh, services um, and then also garbage, sewer, water. Um, roads and parks, those are all, you know, the part of the fundamentals. Um, these are baseline uh, services that municipalities need to, to uh, be able to respond uh, and be responsive to their residents. Um, the second is making sure that our outcomes are, are matching our, um, our, our projected, uh, you know, uh, desires and making sure that if those outcomes are not what we thought, then we need to be able to pivot because we don't have, you know, our margin is thin and we we don't have the room to actually um, uh, lose time or, or tax uh, public dollars um, on things that are no longer meeting uh, the outcomes or hitting the need um, quite in the same way. So we have a strong responsibility to steward those public dollars and administer them as wisely as possible. And we also have the responsibility to sunset uh, those strategies that no longer serve us. So um, those are two, two uh, things that would definitely frame my perspective in the budget. Thank you. So for our next question, we'll start with Mr. Wilson. In hiring Portland's first city administrator, what would be your priorities in terms of experience, expertise, and working styles for that position? Carolyn, thanks for the question. This is a critical position. This is what the voters wanted. They wanted the city to be ran professionally. And so to honor that, we, I, will go outside of our city. I will interview city administrative officers from sister cities or larger. We will verify through their resumes, their record of success, ensuring that they've got the experience to come into Portland and help us with this new system. So I have executive experience. I've been running a high standards, very complex operations for generation, for excuse me, for decades. I know how to focus on key performance indicators. I know how to manage and bring forward a culture of high performers where we don't leave anybody behind, where safety is always valued and quality is always valued and sustainability. But the day-to-day -day operations, we need somebody externally so they can come in with that experience and help us with this brand new structure that, frankly, nobody has the experience in Portland of. But I will tell you, one thing that is the, the most important is, is that we do not make this a political appointee. It has to be a person who has verified record of success to make Portland successful. It is a critical first hire that will set the tone not only for four years, but really for the generation ahead. We have to do this higher right. Thank you. Commissioner Rubio. 
Um, I absolutely agree that um, we need a city administrator, administrator that actually has really great um, skills. Um, and at the top of those skills are, are communication and change management skills. Uh, those are really critical, especially during this time of government transition. Um, I also believe that as um, an executive, new executive, uh, the first city administrator, the skills that they will be needing, much like the mayor, will be very different in this um, in this first term than in subsequent years because they will be creating and changing at the same time. So that is a, a little bit uh, kind of a uniqueness uh, for that position. So I would be looking for that too. That in that way. I could see both sides of having someone external, but also internal that has the credibility and trust that and that knows the city work um, that that um, city employees could feel um, that they are seen and that they're understood um, by that that very first administrator. Uh, so th this will be a very um, interesting hire and, and very important hire for all of those reasons. And, and ultimately, someone that sees the value in retaining the expertise of our city employees in this transition. So those are those are key things that I will be looking for. Thank you, Ms. Ostas. Uh Echoing both of those um, people, I I think that Portland is far behind. We're the small, we're the largest city that hasn't transitioned already to this form of government. So a lot of the people that are very adept at the actual transition phase are maybe in smaller cities, Rust Belt cities. We've already done some thinking about this, about where a good city manager who, who would understand the transition from Portland's old form of government to the new form, where would they most likely be right now? Um, also, we would really need somebody who um, understands our difficulties in collaborating with the county and maybe could had had some ideas about how to smooth that or how to um, make that relationship um, better, stronger. Um, but I, I do hear Carmen's point that that the city employees who are working here now would would really felt feel seen by somebody local. But I, my hunch is that um, a real expert city manager would come from someplace that had already um, experienced this form of government, and somebody who had experienced this transition, I think, would be especially effective in the next four years, and maybe, and yeah in the next four years at least. No, thank you. Okay, for our next question, we go to Commissioner Rubio first. To what extent, if any, should a mayor be expected to model integrity in the mayor's behavior and why? So absolutely, um, the, the mayor should be expected to model integrity. Um, the, the mayor will be seen as the voice for the city. Um, and also, you know, the, the mayor will be seen as the person that is acting on behalf of the city with other local jurisdictions um, and across the country and perhaps even with sister cities around the world. So um, so it's really important um, that things are done transparently, that um, there there is uh, constant communication. And, you know, when when things happen and, you know, people are human and and, and um, mistakes are made, that people are forthcoming about it and transparent right away. And so um, these are important things. And, and also, I, I also believe that what's really critically important is temperament. When uh, we have leaders who um, aren't uh, able or willing to work together, um, that that doesn't just in, uh, affect uh, the uh, that local government; and it affects the whole region. It affects or it, it affects the ability for those governments to get things done, and um, that's why. I think it's critically important that we have uh, leaders who model integrity of also communication and the, the ability to, to talk directly and deal with conflict very directly um, and interpersonally. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Yeah, thank you. So modeling integrity really uh, uh, is clear. In other words, what are your policies of your organization? In this case, it's the city. You know, we have best practices, policies and codes throughout our community. So as somebody coming from the private sector into the public sector, 
we have to understand that managing those policies to the letter is critical. So as a senior leader, if I see a policy that's not being met, if I walk by that policy without saying something, then I've just created a new policy. And that goes for my deputy uh, city administrators or my city administrator. We have to have clear policies, guidelines, and codes, and all of us have to be within those guardrails. If we go outside those policies, then we have to be trained and or a uh, coach to come back in. And that's how a high performing organization succeeds. And in so doing, then you can have outsized focus and hit your core values. And with that, I can explain that at the business I own and operate, we have the lowest workforce injury rate in the state of Oregon. There's not a single carrier that is a safer workforce. That is not because we color outside those guardrails. We always focus on training and training and training. But as a senior leader, the integrity I bring at a high standard and a high focused business, anybody outside those policies, I'm quick to train and bring them back in because I live, eat and breathe all those policies as a senior leader. Thank you. Ms. Ostis. Yes, um, absolutely. A mayor needs to model integrity. I think around the nation, around the world, we're desperate for new leaders who really are people of integrity and honesty. And I think that's one reason I jumped in is um, I, I'm craving new types of leaders. I'm, I want a lot more um, vision from my leaders. And yes, we need a champion for Portland and that person needs to represent the very best of Portland. Um, Portland's got a lot great going for it. And let's have a mayor who reflects that to Portlanders, to the nation, to the world. And communication, absolutely, people do screw up, own it. Forgiveness is always possible. And I mean, yeah, what Carmen said about temperament, that is so key in a leader and somebody who can reach across the aisle, talk to people of different opinions, talk to people um, who are houseless, talk to people who are <laughs> uber wealthy, but always with integrity, always with integrity. Thank you. For the next question, we're back to Ms. Ostis. What skills do you bring to the task of ensuring enactment or implementation of policies adopted by the council? Um, I think the new mayor, the, the role of the new mayor is more of a figurehead. So they do run the risk of being siloed in this new form of government. I mean, that would probably be up to the mayor, him or herself. Um, the, the mayor absolutely needs to collaborate with the council. There are gonna be 12 people who are the voice uh, representing the voices of all of Portland. And on the campaign trail, I have been meeting with as many of those people as I can. It's been the joy of my life to campaign alongside these candidates for city council. They're so bright and so devoted. So, and the mayor is a tiebreaker, right? Um, there, there's little influence in the actual legislative process, but on a relationship level, on a communication level, absolutely the mayor should, can and should absorb what the council is bringing, the opinions of their constituents to the mayor. And then the mayor should reflect those nationally, internationally, and with a tie-breaking vote. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. So, uh, and, and the question was, uh, what skills do I bring? What skills do you bring to the task of ensuring enactment or implementation of the policies the council adopts? Okay, uh, so I have uh, a long history of policy development um, and coalition building skills. So I'm very comfortable in working with groups of people and actually something I, I quite enjoy is bringing uh, stakeholders who oftentimes are at different um, ends of the issue um, into a conversation with one another or trying to find a path forward. Um, so building coalitions, finding common ground, um, navigating conflict sometimes around high stakes issues, um, and then also negoc negotiation all skills that I'm very comfortable with and I feel that actually are my strength. Um, the other thing, uh, around, uh, thing that I'm very uh, skilled at is executive uh, leadership 
and executive management of large organizations. I built a nonprofit organization from a handful of employees um, and um, a little more than half a million dollar budget um, over 11 years to one of over 145 employees. And when I left $18 million in operating, um, and it's, it's even surpassed that now, um, four years later. So, um, having the combination of both those skill sets, um, really positions me well to help navigate and implement policy objectives of our new city council. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. You know, over this past six months of working with the future counselors, I've been building relationships already. It really is a focus on relationships. And that's the job of the mayor, to make sure there's really no surprises that when they bring laws to me, I implement them well. But in the same respects, it's a two-way communication. I need to explain what our vision is, what our mission is, and what those strategies are. So our lawmakers can make those laws to help me succeed. If I succeed, then they succeed and vice versa. And to give you an example, so I was chief petitioner on a bill two years ago. It was to reduce 9% of the emissions in Oregon, an extraordinary bill. It was a swing for a home run, no doubt. And I didn't succeed at it. But creating the relationships with the Republicans, creating the relationships with the Democrats, I was able to learn what they needed. And because of that loss, we created a secondary bill that was going to create as much of a reduction in pollutions in Portland and reducing um, glacier melt. And when I brought that bill forward, and it was from a failed bill, it passed unanimously last year with every Republican and every Democrat voting for it. So while I lost, I didn't give up. I didn't quit. I just pivoted, found out a better way based on the interests of all the parties. And Oregon was the beneficiary and Portland is going to enjoy uh, clearer air and cooler days because of this bill once it's fully mature in about three to five years. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so for the next question, we'll start with Commissioner Rubio. What is your vision for a meaningful community engagement system that operates consistently across all bureaus? It's a great question, and it's something that has been very central to um, why I've even gotten involved in civic engagement and uh, in government um, in the beginning. So uh, I truly believe in a community-centered government and uh, community self-determination. Um, and one of the biggest and, and most effective ways uh, of getting involved in local government is through the budgeting process. And so for me, I would be very interested in um, utilizing, we have such a rich, uh, diverse, um, incredible, um, you know, convicted, active, you know, um, community um, from neighborhood associations to community groups to community-based organizations, artists, um, all sectors very engaged in our in our city. Um, we need to utilize uh, those networks and plug them in uh, to into the budgeting in a way that uh, people can understand um, at a at a much more granular level uh, the how we do public budgeting, what things are actually at stake, and what are the trade-offs. So one of the biggest moves that I would like to make um, as a mayor is to change from a one-year budget to a two-year budget. That would enable us to have more time to do engagement in the community, do meetings in the evening when people can actually go to these meetings because they're working during the day, and do that public education so that there's more input and engagement um, around uh, budgeting, and we have a better sense of what's working and not, um, and we can have the time to uh, set outcomes together and and if needed, pivot from things that no longer work. Thank you. Ms. Ostis. So the, the question again was about community engagement. Vis -vis yeah, the I'll read it again. What's your vision for a meaningful community engagement system that operates consistently across all bureaus? Uh, well, I have heard that the bureaus one of the problems with the bureaus is they each do things very differently. I think to to make things more uniform so that 
each piece of mail that we receive as Portlanders um, looks the same. It looks like the city of Portland and the Bureau of Water instead of very different um, communication styles. So you make that uniform across all bureaus. That should maybe even take care of some redundancies. Like Carmen said, we do have, we're, we're so gifted in that we have this really hyper engaged community of Portlanders and we want to know, we want to be a part of civic life and each bureau, but I think the communication style, there's a lot to be improved upon there, um, just making it more consistent and um, yeah, coordinated throughout the bureaus. I don't think that would take much to do. And like I said, it would identify certain redundancies that, um, that could tighten up our budget um, without too much pain. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. So there's this cliche that I heard many, many years ago, and it says the best fertilizer for a farmer's field are their boots. And what it means is go see, go learn, go talk. Because if you're going to make a decision for somebody, the best person to help you understand the decision is those persons it's going to affect. So over this last many years, I've rode with police officers multiple times, fire departments, all days, multiple days, uh, with several different stations. I've rode with Portland Street Response, and I found out that they want a sobering center, and they'll act as transport for a sobering se center. They want their mission increased, not decreased. I rode with a street cleaner, and the street cleaner explained to me how inefficient his operations were and how their computer systems weren't matching with the other bureaus. When you go out into the field and you talk to the different bureaus, you learn the exact reasons of how they are successful, but also you learn about the opportunities in the city for efficiencies to reduce waste and then to improve safety. So what I'll do, Carolyn, is, is I'm going to work with all of the bureaus specifically and individually and visit each one of them on a regular basis because if you're going to be the mayor, you have to be the mayor of the entire city, every job and of every corner and neighborhood in the city. So it really is a granular focus on understanding what they're dealing with, how we're going to resource, and then those policies are going to be brought forward with budgets and the funds to make those individual departments work and work well. Thank you. So for the next question, we'll start with Ms. Ostas. Who are the largest individual contributors and corporate contributors to your campaign? <laughs> well, we until Keith surged ahead of us, we had the most small donors um, of any of the candidates. Um, most of my donors are $25 and under. That That is still a lot of money for a lot of these people. My big donors, I think, my uncle in Alaska gave us 500 bucks. I think my best friend in California gave us 500 bucks. Gus Van Sant gave us a couple hundred. Um, so it's it's friends, family, and artists. Um, yeah, I've had really meaningful support from artists. I, I must say that. <laughs> Thank you. So, Mr. Wilson. Yeah. So, Carolyn, with the small donor election, it really focuses on the candidate getting out into the community. Uh, and I've worked over time to just meet and greet all four corners of our city. So I lead in and having the most small donor or micro donations, $25 or less. We're about 900 of those uh, contributors. But as far as large donors is what you had said, the max is 350. And we certainly have received plenty of those, not nearly. I don't think I have as many as uh, some of my other opponents, but it's not something that's uh, hurting the campaign. But I'll tell you, I do have support from my son, my daughter, and my wife, and I'm happy to have them each uh, donating 350, which is the max. Thank you. Commissioner Rubio. I would say I'm um, in good company with, with my colleagues here today. Um, I don't have any corporate contributors. I'm participating in the small donor um, election program, which um, I'm capped at $350 uh, dollar, uh, uh, donors. Um, and I probably had some seed money donors um, uh, and $350, donors, uh, $350 donors, uh, primarily from my family, I would say, um, or my close friends. Um, and I was the first uh, small donor uh, mayoral candidate to hit the 750 donation thre threshold uh, for small donors. Um, but uh, by far, I'm not 
I am not the uh, the candidate that has the most 350 donors um, at all. Okay, thank you. So for the next question, we'll start with Mr. Wilson. Which strategies, if any, that are described in the draft 2024 Portland housing production strategy would you support and then please explain? Well, that's just the state of the Portland housing uh, market is poor and plummeting. It goes back to livability in our city with so many people leaving, with investment leaving and small businesses failing. We're struggling. We have 500 permits on the record, uh, uh, which we're expecting to finish the year at. And our goal through our governor's makeup catch up is 6,000 units. We're woefully behind on the housing production. But what do we do to advance that? One of the, the uh, uh, housing production strategies, as Commissioner uh, Rubio has been really good at, is how do we gain additional revenue and make it uh, evergreen? So, you know, we had our Portland Housing Bureau bond, which was a quarter of a billion dollars, but that was in 2016. And we're still building on that. And it only created 1,900 units. Well, we need to be able to add 5,000 units per year. The supportive housing services tax, which we're all going to hopefully vote on a rewrite in next uh, May, allows us an opportunity to carve out tens of millions of dollars every year to put into an affordable housing uh, funds so we can start building affordable housing every year, not just in one fell swoop every 10 years. Another thing is, is we're not building affordable housing affordably. Um, the Albina One project on Flint Street by the Moda Center is $700,000 per door. The market rate, uh, the analog building right next door to it is $300,000 per door. We have a Byzantine process. We have way too much complexity to affordable housing. We have to limit the stack and allow us to build affordably ho affordable housing affordably quick. And our permitting needs to be streamlined. And, and again, Commissioner Rubio has done a lot of good work. But there are cities that will do an office to residential conversion permit in two months. Some cities have built 1,200 units in two years, office to residential. We haven't built one. We have to streamline our process. And as mayor, it is one of the most important things I'll bring together as a strike team mm -hmm. to encourage and accelerate permitting and ensure that we build affordable housing affordably and let developers develop and get, the, get out of their way so we can start hitting those housing production goals that we have. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Um, as the commissioner who led the work on the housing production strategy, I would say all of them are really, really important and critical. And these are actionable steps that are very doable. Um, and, and, you know, right now we are, as we all know, we're in a crisis and we need to start making progress towards that $120,000 or 120000 um, thousand um, housing new units that we need over the next 20 years. Um, but some highlights in particular that I do want to um, um, lift up are definitely we need to continue the permitting work. Um, as as uh, Keith just mentioned, we do have work to do to make sure, you know, we did call the question. We did uh, make sure that we uh, now have permitting consolidation under one authority and in one place, but but the work is still ongoing to change the culture of permitting and the timelines uh, to make sure and to stabilize the bureau through funding to make sure that we have the expertise in house so that now uh, we can now do the work to incent people to continue to invest in Portland to do their development in Portland so that we can create that new housing here. We also need to focus on middle housing and workforce housing so that folks that actually work here in Portland can afford to live here as well. We also need to make sure that we continue to make ground on home ownership because that is the path towards wealth creation. And then finally, new new revenue is, is critically important, um, as um, my colleague said, and uh, we expended all of our bond resources from the Metro bond and the, the city of Portland bond. Um, and we actually got 
40% more efficiency out of those bonds. So we were able to stretch those dollars to create even more housing and leverage them with other dollars, but it's still not enough. So we do need to be putting the pressure on the federal government, on, on the state for more opportunities to partner and leverage, um, as well as um, looking towards the future at new TIF districts that would bring in more money uh, to do more affordable housing in our downtown core and our East, East Portland neighborhoods. Um, and then finally, we have to re-envision our downtown core and think about how we convert and make it pencil out better to make those office to housing conversions um, work because we know that uh, we need to reimagine our downtown. And um, this is one way for us to, to really think creatively moving forward. Thank you, Ms. Ostis. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the 2024 housing strategy plan is, is very comprehensive and wonderful where it's at, but I, I would always like to add a little more vision to some of these projects. Um, and I always maintain that artists can bring that vision for pennies on the dollar. But for, for instance, I think that building new buildings when we have so many that are sitting vacant is environmentally unconscionable. So I would advocate to reduce, reuse, repurpose these um, these buildings downtown, especially start there with these office buildings. And like Keith said, like make the permitting super fast. Um, I think also we need to re-envision our neighborhoods. Yes, housing is important, but like East Portland, they lack grocery stores. They lack places for youth to gather. It's not just housing. Like we need to think more holistically about what do people who live in housing, what do they want what services do they want close by to really make that those people thrive and i think it is i think a rent control arrangement is appropriate at this juncture i think people are getting pushed out um artists people um people who work in bars and coffee shops can hardly afford to live here so some some more vision in the housing strategy plan um including how people actually want to live, how they cluster, and then really revitalizing downtown with arts, music, vision, <laughs> hope. So I guess, yeah, I'll start there. I have more notes, but I think that's about a minute. <laughs> okay, thank you. So one more question, and then we'll go to closing statements. And we'll start with Mr. Wilson for this one. What role, if any, should international affairs play in the agenda of the Portland City Council, including the mayor, and why? That's interesting. So international, you know, you have to conflate that. When we talk about climate, we have to recognize that, you know, that's an emergency internationally, but we have to act locally. So that's a very important action for uh, the mayor to undertake. If we're talking about humanitarian crisis, it's a requirement to message to our community that our dignity and decency has to reach out to others. And I would have to go to the crisis in, in Gaza that's playing out where there are absolutely no winners whatsoever. At the very least, we should be putting pressure on our national congressional delegates and international leaders to call for a ceasefire. And we should voice that. And that's our moral leadership as mayor that we should play in. Do we have a nexus to control that? No. But as the leader of the voice of our citizens, we have a moral obligation to ensure that we are part of the world. And we do that through that mayor's voice, if you will. So I think we do play a part in international um, politics. We do play a part as the international community, but we have to act locally to make sure that we recognize and then we're the voice of our community that stretches beyond our city and to other cities in the nation and to other countries in our world. Thank you, Ms. Ostis. Hi, yeah, absolutely. We need to think internationally. Nobody exists in a vacuum and um, all of these borders are doing us no 
no good services. You know, my friend who ran for mayor, Bim Ditson, he says no borders, but skateboarders. And as we, as climate change really ramps up, we're going to have more and more refugees, immigrants, um, migrants. We need to make sure that we are known as a safe space that takes care of our people, which we can see very clearly right now that we're not doing a great job of that. So it does start at home. Um, I also think moral leadership, like Keith said, um, ceasefire now that's not politically that that should be the easiest thing for us all to say and to put pressure on our our fellow leaders to demand such um yeah portland is just one tiny speck in a giant world and we need to be con cognizant of that and be the best best portland we can welcoming and inspiring to the nation and the world. Thank you. Commissioner Rubio. Um, I agree with my colleagues. We have a responsibility as leaders to to be a more um, moral voice. And I agree that the mayor's voice and the mayor's use of the bully pulpit um, should be used um, um, in situations um, where we can call for action or, or call for change or pressure on national leaders or international leaders or comments um, uh, and insights about wars, about conflict, about immigration, climate, uh, and other other things. I think that is uh, the role of uh, the mayor to to demonstrate where the heart of its community and populace lay. So, in in those ways, I I I, I agree. Thank you all for those answers. And we'll now go to closing arguments. And the first will be by Commissioner Rubio. Please go ahead. Thank you. In this time of change for our city, we need a mayor who can meet the urgency of the moment and get things done. And when I first took office, I took immediate actions to build more shelters and pass millions to reduce gun violence and led the city's new action plans for economic development, housing production, and climate action. And my point is that Portland's problems deserve solutions and not sound bites. And my success record is unmatched. We don't need flashy and we don't need any more drama or division. We just need focused leaders who know how to build coalitions and with the guts to make tough choices. And we have an opportunity in these next few years to make sure our city reflects our values. We have a once in a generation opportunity to redefine our city's blueprint and we have to get it right. So let's build a vision for Portland to become a city that's better than its best. I believe in the power of Portlanders and their government to build a stronger and more vibrant Portland. And I hope that you do too. And it would be an honor to earn your support. Thank you. Mr. Wilson. Thank you. And thank you, Carolyn. Thanks to the League of Women's Voters. I appreciate this opportunity. And also thank you uh, to leave and thank you to Carmen for the uh, opportunity and this discussion as well. Let's face it. My opponents, with the exception of leave, I understand, uh, have had years to build a coalition and deliver results, and they haven't. They've refused to follow proven programs that other cities have used to solve the most crucial issues we now face. We have thousands of our citizens living on our street. Most cities in the United States do not have that. We now have the highest unsheltered homeless rate in the nation. Along with that, They've wasted hundreds of millions of dollars on programs that have not fixed the problems. And as a result, we've lost families, small businesses, and worst of all, lives. I don't like the way the city is being run. And if you don't either, then I'm asking you to vote for me. My experience is vast and relevant and will meet Portland's moment of crisis. The Portland Renaissance that we all want is within our reach. And I'm asking you to join me and together we will repair restore and revitalize the city that we all so greatly love. Thank you. Ms. Astis. Yes, thank you all for being here this evening. It's been lovely conversating with you. Um, I, I believe that Portland is desperate for new types of leaders and this new form of government is indicative of that, that we voted this in and I think the time is now to select an artist for mayor. Um, what I do downtown at Mary's Club for 28 years, I connect with people, I inspire them 
And I listen to their ideas. And that's what I want from a mayor, somebody who really listens, somebody who really connects and somebody who inspires and leads with vision and is compassionate towards the least of us and the most of us who really can take all of our stories and weave them into one giant, beautiful, crazy quilt. Um, I think it's time for more inspiration, more hope, and certainly our city council collaborating with them as they really um, make do the hard work of legislating and um, making the blueprint that we'll use for the next decades. This is a really exciting time, and I think Portlanders have four wonderful choices in to choose for mayor. And I hope I can't wait to see who they pick. <laughs> Thank you. This concludes today's voter forum for the candidates for the Office of Mayor of Portland. We thank each of the candidates for your participation. With the listeners, please share this forum and podcast uh, recording with your family and friends. Uh, we all need as many informed voters as we can get. And if you're registered to vote by October 15th, you should receive your ballot by October 22nd. And then as with all Oregon elections, most voters are going to be mailing in their ballots or dropping them at drop-offs, but in-person voting is available. Check your Multnomah County voters pamphlet online or when the paper comes in your mailbox. To be counted, ballots must be postmarked by Tuesday, November 5th at 8 p.m. You can also find an official ballot drop box location near you by checking www.vote411.org or it's listed in the Multnomah County Voters Pamphlet. The League of Women Voters is a nonprofit membership organization. We hope this forum was meaningful to you and we welcome you to join us or to contribute at lwvpdx.org. This is Carolyn Bupert for the League of Women Voters of Portland. Thank you for watching and listening and for being an informed voter. Remember, your vote really does count.